The pastor of a tiny church in Florida could be inciting a holy war against the Islamic world if he sticks to his plan to burn Korans on 9-11. I am definitely uh, a radical, but not in that sense. I am not promoting uh, the changing of the Constitution. I am not promoting uh, kill, killing of people. Uh, I am radical in the sense that I believe the Bible to be the Word of God. I believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation, uh, to forgiveness. A short time ago, a 9-11 families group issued a statement calling Jones's plan, quote, unacceptable and abhorrent, and an insult to the victims of 9-11 and the many brave individuals who have risen in defense of our nation. Joining me now, the host of The Rachel Maddow Show, right here on MSNBC, Rachel Maddow. Well, Rachel, the emotion uh, behind all of this and the foreign policy implications are enormous. We've had Hillary Clinton today, and uh, this today to NBC News from General Petraeus. Let's watch. Hmm. We're concerned that the images from the burning of a Koran would be used in the same way that uh, extremists used images from Abu Ghraib. Uh, that they would, in a sense, be uh, indelible. Uh, they would be in cyberspace forever. Uh, they'd be non-biodegradable, and they would be uh, used by those who wish us ill to incite violence and to inflame public opinion uh, against us and against our mission here in Afghanistan, as well as our missions, undoubtedly, around the world. And I wanted to share with you what Hillary Clinton said today, not only about this, because she first raised it in her Iftar speech last night at the State Department, but what she suggests about the way the news media ought to cover it. Hmm. This was at the Council on Foreign Relations with Richard Haas today. Let's watch. We are, as you've seen in the last few days, um, you know, speaking out. Uh, General Petraeus made the very powerful point that uh, as seemingly, uh, you know, uh, uh, small a group of people doing this, uh, the fact is that it will have potentially great harm for our troops. So we are hoping that um, uh, the pastor decides not to do this. Um, we're hoping against hope that if he does, it won't be covered. <laughs> <laughs> Well, of course, that uh, raises all sorts of other questions. Uh, what do you make of this? Let's sort of try to boil this down. I mean, it, it, she got a laugh when she said she hopes it wouldn't be covered. I sympathize with her impulse on that. Last night when we talked about this on my show, um, I did the whole story very awkwardly without ever saying the name of the church or the name of the pastor because that's really about what this is, doing something so outrageous that it will be covered, even as everybody condemns it. And we're talking about a church with 30, 40, 50 people but there are ways that the news media can contextualize this. Sure, and you can't, you know, and the, our government doesn't dictate what our news coverage is anyway. It's, right. the, it's the other great part of the First Amendment. And the part of the First Amendment that protects this, it's a great reminder that our First Amendment, our system of values in terms of speech in this country, is about not just thoughtful speech, not just useful speech, not just constructive speech, but idiotic and irrational speech that hurts the country as well. Our solution to harmful speech is more speech. And so the fact that this sort of Fred Phelpsian, frankly, kook of a pastor who's just doing this to get attention is getting so much attention. The one bright spot is that it will, I think, bring out the best in terms of, or at least it ought to bring out the best in terms of Americans who are willing to talk about respect for different religious traditions, the fact that this is not meant to be a holy war between Christian, Christians and, and Muslims. Um, more speech is always the answer to bad speech. I do think, though, politically it's important to recognize the context in which what these folks in Florida are doing makes sense. And that is the context in which religious freedom isn't the point, American values aren't the point. They believe there is and ought to be a holy war between Christians and Muslims. That's a strain of political thinking in the United States. That, yes, it's held by these extremist groups like this kook pastor in Florida, but you know what? It's also flirted with by some people on the right who have, I think, pushed an anti-Islam message around the whole Cordoba Center mosque in lower Manhattan and around well, other images, bring you there. that stokes these things. And you know what? This, it's, it, in rational discourse, we may, not, we may say that there isn't a holy war going on, but there are people on the right who are flirting with that, and I think it's very dangerous. Well, this is a point that Mayor Bloomberg, uh, courting unpopularity on this, even more unpopularity, he was saying that he agrees with the right. To, to have this crazy Koran burning because it's the other part of the First Amendment, as you just pointed out. Yeah. This is Skokie and the ACLU going back uh, quite a ways. I mean, this is 
in the inherent part of the First Amendment. At the same time, we are facing what General Petraeus warns is an indelible image. Yeah. And the fact is that the people over there do not understand that President Obama cannot order this not to happen, nor can yeah. Hillary Clinton order us not to cover it. And the, so therefore, the only thing that responsible Americans, people worried about what this will do, to not only to America's image abroad, but to the physical health and well-being of Americans who are abroad in harm's way. Soldiers, diplomats, all sorts of other people in dangerous places where this might be misconstrued. The, re, the way that Americans who, are, who, who feel responsible and worried about those things have to respond is by creating more speech that condemns this, that makes clear what real American values are around these issues, and honestly, by really engaging with this trope that has emerged on the right, that Islam is not just a religion, it is something that is waging war in America, that anybody who serves as, a, as, as, a, as, a, as a, 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 um, an intern for the Council on American-Islamic Relations, for example, is some sort of fifth columnist inside the U.S. government. That's happening within mainstream politics, and that needs to be denounced. Well, speaking of mainstream politics, the president is about to give a speech in Cleveland where John Boehner spoke two weeks ago and take on John Boehner and try to fight back against, you know, this whole idea of uh, tax break, continuing the tax break, which takes an affirmative act, extending the tax break for the wealthy, mm -hmm. and make a populist argument out of this. But is he also missing the point politically in saying it's all about infrastructure? Is that going to be a rallying cry to try to get the uninspired... Obama surge voters back to the polls and I, save the day for Democrats. The, the understanding the White House strategy at this point, clearly they've got to engage on the issue of the economy. The economy is the is the contextual issue that makes all the difference for this uh, for this election. So they've got to talk about it. They've got to talk about it in a constructive way. And talking about infrastructure used to be something that had sort of bipartisan resonance in this country. Even around the fight about the stimulus, what a lot of Republicans who criticized the stimulus said, well, right. if it was more infrastructure, I'd support it. So in a way, the political impact of this is not that this is going to put a lot of Americans back to work, because even if this thing is funded, those infrastructure projects aren't going to create jobs till next year. The political impact of this is it puts Republicans on record of being against their own ideas. They said they wanted infrastructure, but when Obama proposes it, they're against it. They said they wanted tax cuts, but when Obama proposes it, they're against it. He's going back to the party of no idea. And speaking of the party of no, uh, which makes one think of Sarah Palin and a lot of other stuff <laughs> that you've been talking about. Hell no. Right, the party Megan of hell no. McCain. <laughs> Megan McCain on your show. This was Megan McCain, who's got a new book out, uh, the daughter, of course, of John McCain, on Leno last night. Oh, Let's yeah. watch. Like the rest of the country, I had no idea who she was, and yeah. I was actually like crying on the bus on the way to the rally. I remember being on stage and distinctly remembering thinking, God, let her not have any skeletons in the closet, please, God. I was just scared. I was really yeah. scared. Yeah. I didn't know her, and you know, in politics, I so knew her. So, what did you think? What did you think of her once you, you met her? What was your initial reaction? My initial reaction was, Who the hell is Sarah Palin? Right. Like everybody else, right. you know? <laughs> I just can't wait to see her with you tonight on your show. Yeah, I, I, me too. <laughs> I've done one long interview in the past with Meghan McCain. S totally enjoyed it. Her personality is such that she is willing to engage on all of these topics about which everybody is way more diplomatic, and that makes her a very fun interview. Her book is a lot about this idea of deciding that there are no secrets, that you must be very open about everything in your, in your life. As the kid of a politician, you find out that everybody learns about you anyway. So she has this very refreshing openness that you don't get from a lot of people in politics. But what she's saying about the sort of trauma of Sarah Palin being brought on to the McCain campaign is something that other people associated with the McCain campaign have told me numerous times from numerous different a number of different people involved in that campaign in different ways uh, in the in the months since that campaign ended so to be able to sort of get the insiders take somebody willing to go on the record and talk about it I cannot wait well it's gonna be great we're gonna all be watching I, I swear I heard her call into wait wait don't tell me on Saturday I'm, <laughs> I didn't dream that Rachel but I'll check it out <laughs> right but tonight will be special thank you very much thank Rachel you, Maddow good. thank you uh, midday and of course join Rachel weeknights at nine o'clock Eastern for the Rachel Maddow Show only right here on MSNBC.